Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. at lunchtime, so I left the first line in, where's my food? Hopefully you found your food out there somewhere and you brought it with you. If not, you might want to do that. We're going to talk about the problem of declining enrollment in CS. That's an issue that has a lot of, a lot of um, professors in the United States and Canada uh, concerned. And it's uh, also a trend in Europe. India and China have a little easier situation getting their students motivated, but there's still an opportunity to enhance the classes. And then I'll talk about some projects that we're funding that would be assets that you all can take advantage of that we keep in our curriculum repository. How many people here have heard of the curriculum, Microsoft Developer Network Curriculum Repository? That's wonderful. For the video, uh, the entire class raised their hand. So enrollment here looks like it's perhaps cyclical, but what's really dramatic here is that these declines are perhaps precipitous and they're really reinforced among women's participation participation, which is around pre-1970 levels. So these are the reasons that we're trying to inspire greater uh, interest in computer science, because across the United States, as this study has shown, it's declining. You all got a kit, and in that kit there's a white paper which goes into more details on these numbers and similar studies. So let's compare 1995 1995 was really a banner year for computer science. Everybody wanted to major in computer science. There are a couple um, exciting announcements in the news, ranging from eBay, Amazon, and Yahoo. PlayStation 2 was announced, and Windows 95 really got DirectX to a place where the game industry was finally coming along, and the game uh, experience was delightful. But the game market in 1995 was very different. Online game meant basically you'd, you'd uh, get a bunch of floppies in the mail. <clears throat> Retail was a conventional model for games. All that's very different now, right? Now people buy games over the internet, which is now an assumption that you can bank on. Also, uh, you have user-designed content. Games are much more um, complicated. They're complicated not just in the fact that the AI is state-of-the-art, the graphics are state-of-the-art, but a game platform becomes an entire economic system where people can take advantage of mods. Half-Life will be talking about how people can develop mods and then provide these in Steam and then people can purchase them. Uh, Second Life, I don't know if you're all familiar with Second Life, it has a huge economy, such a large economy that they're able to do philanthropic activities within the actual game. So these games have gotten very, very complicated. And if we compare it just graphically, does anybody recognize this game? It's not its nicest aspect, uh, to be fair. Descent. Excellent. That's right. This is Descent. Let's compare it with another title. For the record, this looks a lot nicer on my laptop than on the screen. but still looks beautiful, and you'll see in a, today's later talk how nice it looks. This is Half-Life 2. So the motivation, and now we're gonna, t we, the earlier talks of this summit talked about intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. This would be a nice example of an extrinsic motivation. And that is game revenues are outpacing Hollywood, at least theater revenues and concerts, and they're also, um, really becoming a cultural phenomenon. This is nice because it's a motivator for computer science students. And that's, of course, predict predicted to grow. So what does all this mean for computer science curriculum? Well, uh, the key thing is with this much money at stake, computer science uh, needs to really maintain a security focus. As people produce games, there's a lot more at stake now within this environment. 
they also have to be multidisciplinary. As games become more complicated, they're actual full stories. So you need people, um, significant animators, storytellers, participating in this environment. And finally, it's about cross-group communication. Getting a computer scientist working with someone that's doing art can be a challenging task. All that's good news because if a kid is motivated to go into gaming, you can then couch the courses moving them that direction and teach them core fundamental computer science skills. All of this is true for a database, maybe not the graphics intensity yet, but they're all great skills to have for any aspect of computer science. If you've heard John Buchanan from EA speak, he, he, he really emphasizes a key point, and that is when you enhance the computer science curriculum for EA, he really wants to make sure you're producing great computer science engineers, not great game developers, because the problems are so hard, we really need to have, we can't dilute the curriculum. So I'm going to talk about some projects, and a really nice project to lead with is Alice and Panda 3D. These are virtual environments that allow programming within a, uh, a um, game engine that allows for an interpretive environment. I can't do justice to this, but fortunately we have some people from CMU that will be able to describe it very nicely. I'll segue back to them, but let me give a summary of some other people in the room and what their activities are. But I, I wouldn't be doing justice to say that we've already used this technology, this graphics environment, with this um, programming mode, and we've dramatically improved retention and also improved student grades. This was a study done by Ithaca College and that study is also in the white paper you received. A similar project um, that we're supporting at RIT will build another virtual world where people can program an interpretive environment. Also at RIT, we have Professor Jessica Bayless building a curriculum that will teach C Sharp and DirectX in a uh, game environment. Professor Bayless is right there if you have any questions, and I'd encourage you to introduce yourself to her. I got too ambitious with my mouse. Also in the room, we have Bruce Gooch, and Bruce and Amy Gooch are developing a curriculum that transcends um, computer science with the with the Animated Arts Department of Northwestern. And let me make sure I'm not. So Ian Horswell is also involved in that project. He's sitting back there. And Bruce, um, without the mask, is in the far back of the room. We asked for pictures a while ago, and these were the pictures the Gooches sent us. And obviously, we have to stick with these because they're just too fantastic. Too incredible. <laughs> too incredible. The College of New Jersey is another school that's looking at addressing this issue with a multidisciplinary program, which really is reaching the envelope and bringing in different aspects of the entire university system. Is Ursula Wilson here? Hi, Ursula. <coughs> this is a great game machine, but it's a, and an excellent developed machine, but it's only a moderately behaved PowerPoint machine. Ian Parberry has developed a number of books. He just came into the back of the room. Well-timed, Ian. Ian has written a number of DirectX books, but he's also produced some curriculum based on DirectX who will make available in the curriculum repository. And then he's also working on a game engine. And this game engine, in contrast to the Half-Life engine, which I think will be very exciting, Ian's en Ian Parberry's engine is designed to be specifically designed for being intuitive and pedagogical. So folks will be able to get their hands into this game engine and really be able to see what's going on. So we're excited by that. Professor Flavio Sores Correa del Silva. I saw him walk in, he's right over there. He's doing um, a project in Latin America. When we did this RFP, a third of all the RFPs came from Latin America. 
Similarly, in robotics, which is another way we're trying to enhance curriculum, we have the largest amount of momentum from Latin America. So Latin America is really doing quite a bit of innovation in uh, the area of enhancing computer science. Flavio, in particular, is developing a class on AI and a more traditional computer science class being enhanced by graphics. And he's looking at building an engine that would allow people to do uh, specific AI environments or AI aspects and incorporate them in the engine. And of course, he can speak to that far better than I can. Steve Feiner is working on a project called Goblin, which would be an augmented reality game engine. I don't see Steve Feiner, but... Hmm, I don't think he's in here. At any rate, he looks just like his picture, and you'll see him wandering around. And he's, of course, the Feiner from Foley Van Dam and Feiner, the graphics tome. And all of this will be put into the Academic Alliance Developer Center's Curriculum Repository. This is a link that I'd recommend you, you take this away from this talk because there's already a number of great gaming assets in it. We have a couple classes from DigiPen, a digital audio class and some C-sharp classes. We have John Laird's um, abstraction for DirectX called the DX Framework. And we have a fantastic paper by John Laird on machine learning which if that's the only thing you get, you'll be really enjoy it. It's a wonderful presentation on the aspects of AI and it's relevant for game design and computer science. So I recommend you peruse that. In reverse order, we, this is currently the academic birds of a feather. After this talk, we'll be looking at DirectX a little bit more closely and then we'll talk about a Vs Visual Studio C++ Express Edition um, co-opportunity co with Half-Life 2, the engine. Uh, in two weeks, we have a graphics event called Microsoft Meltdown, which would be a very nice example of uh, industry and academia working together to look at computer gaming. And during that time, we'll have an academic birds of a feather there as well. So before I get to questions, and hopefully there's a lot of questions, let me segue to Josh Yellen, who will talk about the CMU solution, Panda and Alice, Panda 3D and Alice, which has already been proven to address these issues of in computer science that we were looking at. Do you want to take questions on your presentation, or was that just an introduction, or? I began as suggesting you ask questions throughout. If there's questions now, I'd certainly like to answer them, or we could let Josh present and then open it up to questions. I'll leave that for you all to decide. Are there any questions right now that are in the front of your mind? Okay, very good. All righty. First of all, I have to say, um, I'm pretty honored to be talking to a powerhouse of a room like this. That was a heck of a list of, bi of biographies up there. And collectively, you guys clearly know a heck of a lot more than I do, so I'm hoping you cut in a lot. Uh, what I'm going to be talking about today are really two totally unrelated software systems. The only thing they have in common is they're both tools to help teach uh, programming through the use of game technology. But the courses that they're designed for are very di different. Alice is designed for 100 level introductory programming classes. And Panda 3D is very effective for 400 level classes, uh, especially multidisciplinary game development classes, which is what we use, for, use it for in addition to uh, project courses. So first I'm gonna talk about Alice, and then I'm just gonna drop that topic and switch to Panda 3D later on. So here we go. Uh, my, my demonstration, my talk on Alice is pretty much gonna be a demonstration. So let me just start up Alice here. And before I give you any sort of technical information, let me show you the sorts of things that Alice can, cap that Alice can create. So I'm loading up a world here that was created by students mainly to show off this sort of environment. Now that I've loaded it, I'm gonna hit this play button. We're gonna see a little movie. 
So this character is being controlled programmatically. This is not scripted animation that was created in Maya or 3D Studio Max or anything like that. Her joints are essentially servos in a little robot which are being controlled by a program that was written by the user. Um, one thing that, that's useful about Alice is that to you and me, this may not look like a Pixar movie. But try and look at it from the perspective of a student who is just getting started with programming. They have goals like creating beautiful games or beautiful digital movies. And to their minds, these goals are a million miles away. They believe that it's going to be three, four years before they get to make anything that looks even vaguely cool. So when they come into a classroom and they see that this was created by another student in the first couple weeks of, of programming, suddenly those goals that seemed a million miles away look a lot closer. It may not be Pixar, but we've just compressed the distance from where they are to where they want to be by a great deal. And that's powerfully motivating. OK, so let me show you a little bit how that was made. Um, I'm going to load the same world minus all the stuff in it. So this is going to be an empty world. Not entirely empty. It still has the ground and the scenery and a couple of little cones. But it's missing the ice skater. So I'm going to click this button right here, add objects to this world. Down here at the bottom, you can see a catalog of pre-made objects that you can drop into your Alice Worlds. Let me scroll across. Here we have people. So I'm going to select people. And here we have the ice skater. I can drag and drop her into the world. I can select her, move her around. But so far, I haven't done anything that you wouldn't be able to do in something like 3D Studio Max. So now I'm done adding objects to this world. So you can, see, you can see three panels here in this world. In the upper left corner, we have a list of all the things in the world, the red cone, the white cone, the blue cone, the ice skater. And if I select one of these objects, you can see a list of all the things that the ice skater can do. Over here, we have a program window. So I can take one of these things that the ice skater can do and drag it over here let go, and now it asks me a question. Move which way? Forward, one meter. And I can press the play button to see what that command does. So there we go. All right. And I can select another command from over here, drag it over. And again, it asks me for more parameters. I wouldn't use the word parameters in a real class. I'd just say, it asked me a question. Try and stay away from terminology. So anyway, we turn which way? Uh, turn left, uh, one revolution. And again, I press play to see what that does. All right. So now I've seen what the built-in commands can do. And I'd like to try something a little more sophisticated. I'd like her to, to skate up to that little red cone and skate in a circle around it. So I'm going to look for the command that does that. And sure enough, there's no command that does anything like that. So at this point, I tell the students that I need to teach her something new. So I'm going to take these old commands that I put in here, and I'm going to delete them. And since she doesn't have a command that does what I need her to do, I'm going to press this button over here, create new method. And what I want her to do is to skate around the cone. So there we go. That's the name of the new method. And after I'm done teaching her how to do that, I'm going to drag that command over here into the command window, the same as I did. No, I didn't mean to do that. Let me select back. I'm going to drag that command over here, and I'm going to tell her to perform that task. But she doesn't know how to do that yet. You can see that I have two tabs, one here. This is for the main program. And this over here is for the subroutine definition. I would probably not use those words in a real class. but. Here we go. I now need to tell her how to skate around a cone. So I'm going to go down here, and I'm going to look for a command that lets her turn to face the cone. Um, here we go. There. And no, that didn't work. There we go. Cone. All right. 
So I'm going to press this button, and I'm going to press play. That seems to be working. Now I'm going to add a command to make her move towards the cone. And if I was a student, I probably wouldn't know what to put in here for distance. So ice skater, move forward one meter. Press the play button. Well, that wasn't far enough. Now, anyway, I could go here and click on one meter and change that to, say, two meters. And press play again. Still not quite far enough. Now, I can keep on fussing with that number until I get it right, but what I really should do is, that this is a computer, it should be able to do this sort of thing. So I'm going to click over here on this Functions tab, and here's a collection of functions that this thing can compute. Ice skater, distance two, that sounds promising. Put that over here where the two meters is. Distance to the red cone. So I'm going to press play. Turns to face the red cone, and that's not quite what I wanted. I wanted her to go to the red cone, but I didn't want, to want her to stand on it like that. So really, I wanted her to go that distance, but maybe a little less. So I'm going to subtract one. So here I go. Click on math. Ice skater distance to red cone minus one. And press play again. Okay, so that worked. So now I want to take a step back and, and point out what I just did. I just, in the span of about th two minutes, introduced, I would say, three bugs, debugged them, and fixed them all in the span of three minutes. When you make a, there's really two kinds of bugs out there. There's syntactic bugs, which of course beginning programmers are always struggling with. Those aren't even an issue in Alice. You can't do it with the drag and drop interface. But you can still make plenty of semantic bugs. And that the ice skater going too short, that was a semantic bug. But one of the things that's very nice here is that when I make uh, a semantic mistake, all of, the thing, all of my commands directly relate to something that I can visually see. If I tell her to move and the distance is too short, it's visually obvious that the distance is too short. So, Essentially, it's almost impossible for me to introduce a bug that I can't instantly see. So one of the big things that turns people off to programming is the fact that they're constantly searching for bugs, spending all their time being frustrated by the search for bugs. Here, the bugs just show themselves on the surface, and I can fix them just like that. Okay, so anyway, I said I was going to make her skate around this cone, and I haven't done that yet, so let me just do that. Um, so I'm going to have her ice skater turn left one quarter revolution. And then after that, I'm going to have her turn right one revolution. More over here. I'm going to select that and say, as seen by the red cone. So the turn command actually has an optional parameter which is what axis of rotation do you want to use as the pivot point? So that's what I just did here. But I didn't say it in that ridiculous language to the students. I just said, what do you want to turn around? And make that duration a little slower so it doesn't look so fast. So here we go. Okay, turns the quarter turn to the left, one full turn to the right around the axis of the cone. Okay, so I've just taught her to skate around the cone. But I've only taught her to skate around the red cone. What if I wanted her to skate around the blue cone? Well, I can certainly do this. I can go look for all these red cones, and I can change them all to blue cones. And that'll do the job. And so I press play, and now she'll skate around the blue cone. No problem. But unfortunately, I just kind of taught her how to skate around the blue cone while making her forget how to skate around the red cone. That's not what I want to do. What I really want is some sort of fill-in-the-blank type thing where she can decide what cone to skate around on her own. So I clicked the Create New Parameter button, and I'm going to create a parameter called which cone, which is going to be an object, specifically a cone. Press OK. Now, wherever I have this word blue cone, I'm going to replace that by which cone. 
Here. Here. Now, if I take a look back at the main program, it says skate around and which cone is, and it doesn't know which cone to skate around. So I'm going to put white cone in there. So I press play now, and I now have this character skating around the white cone. And of course, in computer science, I now have a subroutine with a parameter. OK, so now let's say I want her to skate around all three cones in succession. In fact, I might have a heck of a lot of cones. So what I could do is I could actually create a list of all the cones. Create new variable whose name is cones. And that's going to be a list. I'm going to add something to the list, the red cone. I'm going to add something else to the list, the white cone, the blue cone. There we go. And we have a variable which is initialized to this list of cones. So now what I can do is I can, if you look down here at the bottom of the screen, you'll see all kinds of con familiar control flow constructs. So this is just a, a looping mechanism that loops over a list of objects. Drag that up in here. Um, and there we go. We have a loop, and it has an empty body. I'm going to take this uh, skate around the cone, and I'm going to drag that up into the loop body. There we go. Um, and that is almost right. So now for every cone, it's going to try and skate around. And what's missing here is the white cone. It should not be white cone. I should drag this variable from here to here. And I'm going to press play again. And she's now going to skate around each cone in turn. All right, so that's not bad. And after all that, I think I'd like to have her look at the camera and smile, maybe nod her head or something like that. So now I'm asking her to do something that I haven't done before, which is move a part of her body. So up here, we have the list of objects. But those objects have subparts. So I can actually dive down into this tree looking for her head. There it is, and I can select the head. And now the head can do all the same things that, well, it can do many of the same things that the body can do. So I will now say head, um, turn to face, camera. And finally, I think we have the program that I like. Well, maybe not great. <laughs> All right, now, there's something you want you to notice. How many times in your introductory programming class did you actually, were you actually motivated to laugh at something that you created? There's a lot of reward here. Seeing these characters do funny and interesting things is far more powerful than balancing a checkbook. And so that's your second source of motivation here. And there's one last thing I'd like to point out before I go back to the PowerPoint slides, which is that I've been talking about this for maybe 10 minutes. And I just defined a subroutine, used arrays, I used variables, uh, I used object-oriented constructs, methods, and, and method invocations. Um, I have uh, control flow constructs. I've pretty much hit the highlights of what programming is, and I did it in a way that probably wouldn't have confused your mother. So basically, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to drop out of this and go back into my PowerPoint. If I were to, to summarize the benefits of Alice in three basic points, hang on a moment. I was supposed to press this little button. It immediately makes the student feel like his goals are much closer, and that's powerfully motivating makes the bugs visually self-evident. And that removes a tremendous amount of frustration. And finally, it takes these concepts, which normally you can only explain in terms of very bizarre jargon, and now you find yourself able to say things like, I'm going to teach the skater to do a new thing, instead of, I'm going to define a new method on this instance. 
So basically, you bypass the jargon and you can express things in terms of real physical world concepts because you're controlling something that looks like a real physical world. Okay. So anyway, um, John already kind of beat me to the punch on this one. But I want to go back to this slide because this is very important. Uh, they wanted to know, you know, they, they'd been working on this, Alice, for a long time. And they were convinced that it was a good thing, but they really wanted some numbers. And anyway, so they did a little controlled experiment. Uh, they took a bunch of at-risk students who had signed up for Intro to Computer Scientists. I don't remember how they evaluate at-risk students, but basically they have this, this way of predicting whether or not a student is going to fail Intro to Computer Science. And all this C 47% means is they're pretty good at predicting which students are going to fail. They, they pinned it. So they, gave, they split these students into two groups. And the first group, they just taught the regular intro, computer science, Pascal, whatever it was, I don't know. And the students got a C, more or less as predicted. And most of them, more than half of them, did not continue in computer science. The other half, they gave them a mini course on Alice before they taught them intro Pascal. These students did learn Pascal. They just didn't do it first. They did Alice first. So after doing that, these same students, now these are the at-risk students. These are not the general students. These are the students that they had identified as people who were probably going to fail. Those students stayed in the program with 88% likelihood. And they got these. That's pretty good. All right, so anyhow. Sure. I want to open it up here. This is really the value proposition that this talk is meant to present. And this is a great place if people have objections or insights as to, does this make sense? Is this something we should look at? Certainly, we can look at other tools like Alice and Panda. We can look at Alice and Panda, but uh, should we be enhancing computer science in this way? It looks like it's effective. What are people's impressions and experiences? Bruce Gooch in the back. I hate to I hate to admit this, but I'm not on the Alice team. I'm on the Panda 3D team. Uh, the other person who who does Alice was not able to make it here today. So I'm, I'm coming here with very superficial knowledge of, of, of this stuff. So the question was, how do you control for instructor bias? And the specific people that did the research in Ithaca College aren't here with Alice. But it's certainly an issue, and it's the same issue we're all going to face. If we introduce new curriculum, if we do assessment, how do we control? Because the enthusiasm for this effort is going to be huge, and it won't be an apples-to-apples -apples comparison. And we're going to be doing assessment over the next few years, and that's going to be something we're going to look at controlling. And, and in fact, there's, there's another thing which was not controlled for, which is even more obvious, which is that these kids had more time, but because they took a mini course in advance. But on the other hand, there's another way of looking at that. These guys, 50% drop off after only one semester. These guys, 88% were still there after a semester and a half. So depending on how you look at it, that may be a success. So if you have an idea of doing another study like this and other, er, other ways to do assessment, I'd love to talk to you because this is something we're really motivated to get better science on. Ursula Wolfs in the back, please. I was an old logo person, okay? And there's a lot here that's, it's including to teach something how to do something. Yes. Um, and there's this big question that comes out of the education community is where's the transfer? So I think this is absolutely wonderful. And I think for my students in particular, um, this would, it would solve a whole bunch of my problems in getting across variables and, and iteration and lists. But the proof is not in the fact that they took the second class but they transferred to all the jargon. And so the next layer of studies really need to look at that is how 
it, How much transfer? Were they able to do the, the, the cognitive transfer between the, the natural vocabulary to the technical vocabulary and extend that and be successful in, in a, forgive me, I'm also a SIGSI person, but a real, a real man's computer science two class. Right, right, I understand that, but what we're talking about are the same set of concepts. The real question is whether they've, you know, they've seen the concepts in one environment, then they see it in the Pascal environment. But can they take that mastery of the Pascal environment and then extend it? Okay, and that's been, that, that really has been an open question that's been debated at SIGSI for at least 10 years, and people have been debating this issue for at least 25. Actually, I could think of explanations for the high retention rate that, that don't, include transfer of knowledge. For example, they may have started over with uh, CS1 and simply been more enthusiastic about it because they had higher expectations and were more willing to slog through it because they were, you know, expecting more having seen Alice. And so there may not have been any transfer of knowledge, right. but can I just a transfer of motivation. I think in terms of, you know, there was a lot yesterday about in motivating students to take computer science. And I think, you know, my, my personal statement is if I have to teach one more student how to convert from Celsius to Fahrenheit in any language, my brain will explode. Yeah, okay. And I, I mean, I know a lot of CS1 teachers who feel that way. And so the real question is that if, if we can get the larger CS1, CS2 community to believe that you can learn a language that's disconnected from the language du jour and then transfer in. If you can really show that evidence, then you're going to start getting national, national co coverage. Because I, that really has been the problem since the logo days. Can, Steve Finer has been patient and I want to introduce him. This is Steve Finer. I mentioned him earlier and I discovered him in the audience. <laughs> no, I, I have uh, t two comments. One of them is that there, there are, as you pointed out before, an obvious confound with this experiment, namely that there is not merely additional time, but there is an additional, you know, tutoring. And depending upon the size of that little Alice class, it might have been very personal and very exciting. That's and of course, you can control for that by having a similar kind of Pascal tutoring being given to the other group. Uh, now, another uh, comment, which is maybe a little intended to be a little provocative, is so we're talking about can you actually transfer um, from this very fun, enjoyable way of specifying a program to using what Ursula referred to as the real man's, you know, real men, you know, don't uh, use uh, GUIs kind of uh, attitude. And maybe another way to look at it <laughs> would be the why should we be using those really unpleasant languages with less than wonderful environments, why shouldn't we be using this kind of more visual environment in doing all the rest of the not necessarily skaters on ice kind of programming? And so maybe in a completely different domain, instead of using the conventional language in a conventional uh, programming environment or lack thereof, maybe we should do something that is much more visual like this for that as well. So that of course there's obvious transfer because there is no transfer, you're using the same kind of environment. Fair enough. Fair enough. Go ahead. Um, Hang on. Lines, one of the things along those lines, uh, what we usually do at Rice is we, we will start with something where it's wrapped up more like this, is, like Alice is. And then we would go through a process of what we call peeling the onion to slowly transition students to the um, uh, underlying, you know, bare bones code. Uh, well, the, the original question actually was re related in that sense that um, we have a lot of students that come in and we, if you show them something like this, you work with something like that, which, you know, you're preaching to the, to the choir here. And it's certainly, in my opinion, emphasizing the right things, the syntax independent issues. But you know, certainly we get those students that raise their hand and say, when are we going to do real programming? Uh, does anyone have any good snappy answers for that? Because I'm always at a loss for a good snappy answer for that one. <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it, the problem, of course, is there's that mentality, that, that culture, right? That says, no, this can't possibly be real programming. And we have students that will actively uh, reject it on that basis. You know, even though all of us know that we, we're doing the right thing, we're emphasizing the right thing, the students will actively reject it at times. Ken? 
Yeah, I've had that experience too. Can so um, I'm a big fan of this, um, but you probably know. Um, but in one thing that I'm always thinking when I see somebody who using a GUI to do this kind of thing, and you know what, you know, turn about the cone is, and you know what face is, and you know what this is, and we're watching a person who already is an expert, um, there's nothing in those choices that I'm a student, I'm clueless, I've never programmed before, that tells me, do I go through these one at a time? What do they do? How do I know what they do? Um, can you speak to the process of the student who is in the clueless state approaching something like this and what that's like and how they can, wander through it? I can only speak to my imagination because, like I said, I'm not in the team. But I really do believe they probably do fumble a lot. But the fact that they get instant visual feedback that they, you know, the skater's going in the wrong direction, that wasn't right. You know, so at least they don't have to, to you know, build up a long sequence of commands and then try it. They can try each command in a sort of a, a back and forth interactive way. They're not fumbling as much. Yeah, I just, I know in the interest of time I shouldn't talk too much, but I just no. wanted to, um, you know, you mentioned Logo and Amy Bruckman reports some of the things with Moose Crossing and there's, you know, and, and all of the follow on, you know, scratch and squeak and, you know, all that stuff. There's. I was talking a year ago with an NSF program officer who came up with a, a great phrase I'd never heard before. She referred to the 10% who are the math kids. And we're all math kids. Everyone in this room is a math kid. And what people have discovered with things like Moose Crossing and with Logo and with various things is that there is this certain subpart of the population that you give them bricks to build with and they just race ahead and they just start making things. And most people, when you give them this kind of building block, there's this weird sort of fumbling and it's just not the way most people think. And I think you're making it easier, but I still don't get the sense that it's kind of solving that problem for the greater part of the population. I wonder if you could speak to that. My guess is that this should be, well, and this is combined with traditional instruction. You know, the, the, the instructor should be at the front of the room guiding them through the process for at least the first several programs. They should have a textbook. They should be reading it and, and, and trying to, to learn. I mean, basically all the things you describe are problems that would occur in Pascal as well. And so, yeah, all the tools that work for guiding you know, students through the process of learning Pascal should work in the same way with Alice, hopefully with less pr pain on the debugging side and more immediate feedback and more immediate reward. Jessica Bayless, go ahead. Oh. There's another mic bouncing around, isn't there? Uh, yeah, I have it, okay. but I'm not very fast. <laughs> um, I just wanted to make a little comment that actually I am currently running a summer distance CS1 course um, with games as an application area overlaid onto traditional um, curriculum. Okay. And I actually have several of the students online right now who are chatting back and forth with me who, and actually a couple, couple of them have done Alice. Um, one of the biggest comments that we seem to get on things like this is that they feel very constrained um, in the end. It's good in the beginning. Everybody seems to say it's really good in the beginning, but then it becomes somewhat constraining, and they become frustrated with the constraints. Um, I actually had a student that I was just, who was just chatting with me, um, who says that he tried a programming language, not Alice specifically, but one of the ones like that, and said that he got frustrated with it. He went out and bought a book on BASIC and apparently fumbled through it, said it was a lot more frustrating, he had a lot harder time, but it was more rewarding in the end for him. Yes. Um, I, I worked on massively multiplayer games for a little while. And one of the things that you find is that people are willing to stick with it in proportion to their expectation of eventually being able to win, all right? If they think they're gonna win, they'll stick with it through thick and thin. If they think they're going to lose, they'll quit right away. That guy may have found the basic more rewarding, but I'm hoping that the Alice set him up with the expectation that he was in control. He's like, this tool is now limiting me. I'm beyond this tool. It's time for me to move on. That makes him feel powerful, and, and it's good that he moved on. 
but he nonetheless gained some motivation there. It's a good question. Uh, at the Entertainment Technology Center, for a while we were using Alice for our high-level courses, and we eventually moved away from that into a, a much more powerful 3D engine, which I'm going to tell you about soon, for that very reason. Ken? J just to push on the same point, you know, we've sort of seen this in education over and over again. There's a Nerf environment where you can do certain things easily and get certain ideas across easily, and then you hit the same brick wall. Mm -hmm. So, so you hitting the same brick wall a little bit later is better than hitting the same brick wall from the very beginning. Absolutely. But it's actually be nice to not hit the brick wall. So, so actually having an environment where you can start out very nerfy and then take off some of the training wheels and grade and smoothly go to something more complex as opposed to simply saying, okay, you've waded around this shallow pool, let's drop you into the ocean in the tides, in the riptides. You know, it, that's, that's a gap in the way that we're thinking about I think, that's a, I think that's a very valid way to progress with development of Alice. Make it so that you can use a real text editor to write the code, use a real programming language to write the code, make the 3D engine more powerful. Everything you say is, is very valid. Quick question in terms of timing. What do you see as how much of mini course do you do for that? Sorry, what? How much, how much time would you say, would you want to do a two week, a when you say, we, we pre the Alice class if you do ahead of CS1. What order of magnitude time investment are we talking about here? Hold on a moment. Don, do you know the answer to that one? How, how long was the mini course? No clue? I have no clue. And do you know of other efforts of kind of, when we face the same problem that we have a very diverse student population, we don't really have what I would call at risk students, but we have students that have taken AP in high school and students that have not taken AP and it's very frustrating for uh, the not AP takers to be dropped into the same uh, pool as the ones that have because they get frustrated and the AP takers get frustrated because they just sit there rev reviewing the same material. We've done some work with having a separate class but it doesn't really work, it's not as binary, you can't just do Man, there's this one group here and there's the other group here. There's lots of people kind of in between. They know a little bit, but maybe not enough and all that. So I'm curious as to whether having these kind of intermediate steps, but it only worthwhile if you can do it in a time horizon that makes sense simply because of the academic schedule. You can't just suddenly start in the summer if that's what you're doing. It needs to fit into the schedule somehow. Yeah, uh, and, and those are all open questions. So I'm going to jump in here. Um, it's a little bit unfair to do this to Josh because he's not from the panda side of things. I'm, I'm not. I'm enjoying myself. <laughs> he's been doing a great job, but it is a little bit unfair and I have to sleep at night. So <laughs> let's, let's, um, let's let him show panda because this is really his brainchild and it's a really nice technology. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. So anyway, uh, talk to now. All right. Um, okay, so anyway, here's a list of schools that are teaching with Alice, a couple of serious ones like uh, my uh, alma mater, Illinois, uh, and we do have a textbook. So now back to uh, the other program. Uh, Panda 3D is basically just a 3D engine. What makes it uh, desirable to us is that it supports our teaching style. So before I can really tell you anything more about uh, Panda 3D, I have to tell you about the teaching style that we're trying to achieve. Uh, we have uh, an introdu introductory multidisciplinary game development course uh, called Building Virtual Worlds. And when we first started out, this course was very much like almost all the multidisciplinary game development courses that I've heard about over the course of this, uh, uh, this conference. Uh, basically, we would put the students into teams, we'd give them a semester to make a game, they would make a game, and they'd turn out pretty good. And that went on for a couple years, and then the person who was teaching that course made uh, a small change to the syllabus. He decided to basically give the students a warm-up project that only lasted two weeks before he gave them the full-fledged, uh, you know, semester-long game development project. And at the end of the two-week period, he found himself in a very bizarre position because the students had just turned in games that blew away all the games that he had gotten in previous semesters. Um, and so here he is 
two weeks into the semester, the, the students have already just, you know, beaten his expectations, and now he isn't sure what to do. So eventually, uh, he decided to do another two-week class and see what happens. And we don't really know why this works, but of course, I have my theories. Um, game programmers are notoriously bad at estimating schedules. They have no way of estimating how long a particular feature is going to implement. And that's true throughout the game development industry. But if that's true of game development professionals, it's particularly true of game developers who have never implemented anything ever before. They have absolutely no idea how long something's going to take. And when they produce a proposal, it's inevitably ridiculously hard, so many features that they, they couldn't possibly do it in a semester, and they don't know it. And you have to rein them in as much as you can, but it's very difficult. Anyway, what happens with the two weeks projects, in my theory, is that all of a sudden you've sort of slapped some sense into them. Basically, they say to themselves, oh my god, I've got two weeks. There's no way I can do anything in two weeks. And they immediately cut features to the bone, cutting out everything they can think of. And that is exactly the right thing to do. So what you end up with is some very simple but good games. All right. So anyway, uh, the other reason that I think this ends up working in the long run is that and the reason that this is also particularly relevant to this talk, if retention is a problem, and as one of the other speakers said, students seem to have this irrational feeling that they're failing even when they're doing just fine. We don't really know why that is. We also know that that's particularly, particularly the case with women. But the solution to that is early in reinforcement and iterated reinforcement. This is just basic psychology. Like I said, I, talk, uh, I worked on massively multiplayer games for a while, and any massively multiplayer game designer will tell you, if you want to people to stay in your massively multiplayer game, give them lots of early reinforcement. Make them feel like a success early on. So if you think about a, a game development program where you have one semester to make a game, automatically you have just set a rule that the first reinforcement will not come for at least one semester, right? Whereas if you have a two-week cycle, then they can have their first su success two weeks into the course. And in fact, um, it's possible after one success to delude yourself into thinking that you're still incompetent even though you had a success. After three, four, five really nice looking games, you start to suspect that maybe you're not so dumb as you thought you were. All right, so this is very motivating. So we really want to be able to teach classes where they develop games fast for the iterated rapid reinforcement. Okay, so in order to do that, we need a 3D engine that supports that. Now, everybody was pointing out that uh, you know, the, the students will feel frustrated if you stick them in Alice and you constrain them to limit limitations of that 3D engine. And that was what was happening to us for a long time. You really need a professional quality 3D engine. But it still has to be an engine that you can learn in a week and that you can make a game in two weeks. That's a tough, that's a tough combination of features right there. And in particular, that's not the Unreal Engine. You take a student, you put them with the Unreal Engine in a room for two weeks. Two weeks later, you've got a very frustrated student. Okay. So anyway, uh, hang on a second. Uh, a few years ago, we discovered this engine called Panda 3D. Uh, one of our professors was, uh, uh, he came to us from Disney, and he had been working on this, and he knew about it, and he told us about it. And it turns out that Disney had created this 3D engine for use in some of their uh, uh, amusement park attractions. And after they used it for their amusement park attractions, they ended up using it in this massively multiplayer game called Toontown Online. And after that, uh, they've continued to use it for a bunch of things. Uh, the most recent game that I know that came out with this engine was a uh, physics-based 
a pinball game that uses ODE for the physics and uh, uh, Panda 3D for the rendering. And you can get that off the Disney website. Um, and I'm under NDA, so I can't tell you that much, but I can tell you that they're still using this in large projects. Um, so anyway, they made this engine free software in 2002. This is probably the only thing that Disney has ever made free software. Um, when they did this, uh, we looked into it. And since then, we've gradually been using this engine in more and more of our projects. And the development has sort of split with them doing all the hardcore feature stuff. And our part of the development process is basically refining it for our needs. And like I said, our needs are short learning curve and really rapid development. So anyway, just to give you an idea what happens when you take students and you give them Panda 3D and you put them in a room for two weeks. And by the way, our, our students are multidisciplinary. We, when I say put a team of students, I mean maybe a programmer, maybe a visual artist, maybe a sound engineer and a script writer. Um, so anyway, when you put them together, you get stuff that looks like this. Wait a second. Oh, hang on a second. I just realized I didn't hook up the sound cables here. So I'm going to turn up the sound on my laptop as high as, high as it goes, and we'll cross our fingers. This is a cutscene. Okay, I need to explain for a moment here. When this game was played, they had a digital camera pointing at a group of people like yourselves. And the instructions are that in order to drive the Jeep to the, to steer the Jeep to the left, you guys have to lean to the left. And to steer the Jeep to the right, you have to lean to the right. The software for the digital camera was provided for them to detect whether or not an audience was leaning. So anyway, go on. They got a little tutorial in here. And then the interactive part of the game begins, and the dinosaur starts eating people. <laughs> so the people in the car actually tilt in to reflect what the audience is doing. And if you can, whenever the, the dinosaur lunges forward, you have to get the car out of the way, otherwise the dinosaur will grab somebody out of the car. All right, so there you go. Um, and so if you think about this game, you know, in terms of the game mechanics, it's really not that complicated. You've only got two actors moving back and forth. You've got the scenery, which I believe is a pre-recorded track. And so, you know, when I say they've cut features to the bone, they, this really is a fairly simple program, but it's a game and it works. Um, and it looks pretty darn good for two weeks. So anyway, they go on through the semester, and by the time they're getting to the end of the semester, creating their you know, fifth game in a two-week period, they're starting to get a little more complicated than that. So here's another game from a little later in the semester. And you can find a lot of stuff going on in here. Oh. All right, in that case, let's do that again. Yes. If you look at the art assets real closely, it's obvious that they're hasty. I don't know where the mic. Okay, so so far this is all cutscene. But you'll notice. They actually built a tire controller for this. 
Now you've got to roll the growth of the hospital in the tire. You know, it wouldn't be a student project if it wasn't perverse. Um, so you see a lot going on here. You've got light map shadows, you've got facial animation, you've got full scene animation, you've got event triggers when the person gets close enough to a particular object in the world, which you're about to see in a moment here. Credits are on the front. I can go back to the credits as soon as this is done. Hurry up and let's get to hospital. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop that there, uh, and I'm gonna roll back to the credits. And so, um, Chris Antemary, Sean Goodrum, William Hung, and Ross Popoff. They're all boys. Yeah, they're all boys. <laughs> and and Stephanie Pickens playing the part as Eve. Oh uh, well, what can you do? What did you expect from such a perverse world? Um, all right, so hang on a second. Let me turn this off. So anyhow, Panda 3D, as far as I'm concerned, is just the tool that lets us do this two-week turnaround time thing. Uh, the reason it's useful to us is that it was clearly designed with, uh, with uh, rapid development as a priority. And you can sort of see that in all the different facets of the engine. Uh, it has a Python binding, which actually lets you control everything from the highest level function of the engine down to the lowest level, which really makes it, e because Python is an interpreted language, it makes it easy to, to sort of inspect the data, uh, browse around, interactively play with the engine, which is very helpful during the development process. It has a very straightforward API, basically load model, set position, pretty much what you would expect, the commands do what you want them to do without having to do a lot of fooling around. The engine has some complex algorithms in it. For example, uh, a lot of 3D engines, including Panda, have, have portals, which is a mechanism for speeding up uh, the rendering of large scenes. But uh, the problem with portals is that they require you to do a fair amount of pre-processing on your scene. And setting, they require you to set up your data very, very carefully. And that makes the development much more complicated. So Panda has been designed to try and hide those algorithms as much as possible. Panda supports the portals, but they have them essentially turned off unless you specifically go and ask for them. All right, and, and the last thing that really makes it clear that it was designed with rapid prototyping in mind is that it responds very well to user error. These kids make mistakes all the time. And the engine has a real tendency not to crash, but instead to print out some sort of reasonable error message and to, to, to print out a, a, a display of the data structures so that they can see what's going on there. Hang on a second. So anyway, all I can say here is basically, we really value this short turnaround time uh, development cycle, game development cycle. Panda supports this. And it supports it while still being a, a commercial quality engine that's being used by a real game company for real commercial titles, so they don't feel very much like they're boxed in or constrained. And in fact, they have the, the source code, so if they want to add some new graphical effect, they're capable of doing that. And our goal right now is basically just to grow the community, make more people aware that this thing exists, and hopefully get some people to to help us with the development of new features here. Okay, so we're we're really short on time, but if, if there's three minutes worth of questions, I'll take them. Sure. Actually, if there's any panda questions, I do want to take at least one or two panda questions first. Uh, I'm sorry. The the. The BVW class is a, the first class in a master's program. And they're working computer science under undergrad. undergrad yes. The, the, these kids, they know how to program. Right. The artists, they know how to make art, but none of them have ever made a game. OK, any other questions?
Under .NET. Um, well, it, it's a very, very large body of C++ code, so there's a heck of a lot of code to port if you want that. I mean, now, uh, maybe you can just compile. I, I, I don't know enough about .NET. This question is for both speakers, but also for others in the audience. Uh, I'm the Editor-in-Chief for the ACM Journal of Educational Resources in Computing, and I would love to see a special issue of our journal on computer science education with gaming. Um, it could be descriptions of a system that's suitable for that. It could be descriptions of curriculum. It could be descriptions that of, sounds great. Of, of experiments, of gaming, and, and results from those things. It could be resources that people want to submit to help in, in this as toolkits. Uh, so we're very open for that. I'm, so I'm looking for people who'd like to contribute to this and also uh, one or two who'd be willing to help as co-editors for this. Wonderful. That's great. Um, we're going to have to break soon. Before we do that, I'd like to remind you that there's a DirectX talk next in the Hood Conference Room. I'd like to take a moment to thank Josh for an excellent presentation. Thank you. And I'd certainly like to thank you all for attending. Please do the survey, and I hope to see you in the upcoming talks later today.